welcome everyone. I'm Celine Urquides. I'm the coordinator for this project. Uh, so I want to welcome you all here. Uh, we are at the Pregnancy and Parenting Forum today here at Ability360. Uh, just a brief overview of our agenda. We're going to start with our welcome, which I'm doing right now. We'll move into a quick overview of the project and some of the initial findings. And then we'll move into a panel of individuals with lived experience who are going to share a little bit about um, their experience as parents or with pregnancy. And then we're going to move into a group discussion, hopefully facilitate some conversation here in the room. And then we'll wrap it up for the day. All right. So uh, our project is called the Pregnancy and Parenting Support for People with Disabilities. And it's funded through the Arizona Developmental D Disabilities Planning Council. So um, this project started out as a work group between a few different um, organizations. So us coming from the Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities, we partnered with um, a, a vast major like majority of the uh, organizations listed here to conduct regular uh, work group meetings and uh, some assessments, look at national data that um, really just helps us see what the big picture is when it comes to individuals with disabilities and their experiences with pregnancy and parenting. And in all honesty, there wasn't a lot of information out there. Um, a lot of the discussion was we don't know what individuals nationwide, let alone here in Arizona, um, are experiencing. And so we really needed to conduct some assessments and surveys in order to get that information. Um, so we partnered with Ability360, uh, the Division for De Developmental Disabilities, the Spinal Cord Injury Association, Raising Special Kids, uh, United Healthcare, and I know March of Dimes is in there as well. Um, but we just want to thank everyone who came from those organizations here today as well. Um, so after conducting those initial assessments, uh, we decided that the goal of this project, once we got the funding, was to better understand and increase awareness of um, the experiences with, of people with disabilities when it came to pregnancy and parenting. Um, so early in our project, um, some interviews, focus groups, and surveys were conducted in order to collect this information based on the findings. Uh, the next step is to develop training and education materials, not just for individuals with the experience themselves, but also for um, medical professionals and other support service professionals as well. Um, and the last goal is to develop some peer support groups. We want to make sure that there's a network of other individuals statewide that are able to provide support for each other. Okay, we're going to move it over to uh, Dr. Austin Duncan. He's going to share a little bit of the findings from our initial data collection. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Austin Wiley Duncan. I'm a postdoc with the Sonoran Center and a medical anthropologist. Uh, and I was basically um, running in charge of collecting data and doing some preliminary analysis that I'm going to be sharing with you this morning. So next slide, please. So for finding out information about the um, project that we were um, embarking on, we worked with our partners to develop practical and engaged community-driven research. That's not research that works for you know, lofty, studious goals that will be turned into books, dissertations, et cetera, but to actually focus on discovering the gaps in services that are needed in the community and what the people that we were talking to actually say that they want and need. Because way too often research just focuses on what is as opposed to what individuals in the community are actually desiring. Um, so we built this study from the experience of parents who have disabilities and those who work and care for and with them. We include all of them in our um, mix of methods research to try and find out what exactly is going on on the ground. Um, so the first thing that we did was conduct surveys, both with parents and clinicians. And while we were distributing those surveys, 
I developed specific interview and focus group questions to be conducted specifically with parents who have disabilities, with clinicians who care for them, and also with other professionals and NGO staff who work with them. We conducted all of this research throughout the calendar year of 2023. In fact, my, my very last interview was actually January 4th. So that, that bullet is not entirely accurate. It's more like 2023 to 2024. Next slide, please. For this, we distributed surveys and spoke with several different kinds of parents who have disabilities. So we tried to cover a range of, of different disabilities, many spinal cord injuries and mobility disabilities, but also intellectual and developmental disabilities, sensory disabilities, and others. With parents who are recent parents, as in they've been parenting for you know one or two years, parents of teens and adolescents, because that was a big expressed need in the community. Uh, more seasoned parents whose children were uh, growing and heading off to college or even into the workforce. And then finally, grandparents. In other words, parents who have disabilities, who have um, parented long enough that they now have grandchildren. Uh, then we also spoke to various clinicians throughout the Arizona area, primarily in Tucson and Phoenix, and several professionals. That means NGO staff, agency staff, so with DDD and DES, and social workers. Next slide, please. Our surveys had about 30 questions. Now, I wasn't involved in developing the surveys, but I definitely oversaw their collection. Uh, they were with parents who have disabilities as well as clinicians. Then I developed these focus groups and interviews to discuss treatment, services, and supports for that parents needed throughout their children's lives. Questions that I asked to parents who have disabilities, to clinicians, and to staff at organizations. Uh, next slide, please. So without further ado, our key findings. Um, it should not come as any surprise to anyone that one of the most notable things that everyone uh, spoke about was that parents who have disabilities want to have kids for the exact same reason as everyone else. Yes, they have other concerns, but as far as actually having children, they're just they're just, they are just normal people. Um, the problem is. The clinicians who work with them do not receive training in how to interact with patients who have disabilities. This runs the gambit from working with clinicians when you're talking about starting a family, so family planning, then what to do when individuals with disabilities become pregnant and carry to term, then in the delivery process, and finally in parenting throughout their children's lives. Um, and also that that relates to uh, grandparenting. There there just isn't clinicians do not have any training in how to talk to or uh, counsel individuals who are like this who have disabilities. Um, and it should also come as no surprise because of that there there are no real systematic services or supports. You know there are services and supports that sort of you know they're they're one off. They're developed by the clinicians who have knowledge about disabilities to work with parents, but there's nothing systematic in the state. Um, consequently, there's also no listings of services and supports that parents might need. And this came up time and time again, that parents, even individuals who have done it all, who are grandparents now, see a need for a comprehensive listing that is somewhere that they can go over with clinicians or even research on their own for services and supports in the state, in the country, and just in general. Uh, so because there is none of that, what really made the difference in parents' lives and in their experiences uh, with pregnancy and caring for their children as they grow is that the social support that they had from friends, spouses, and families really mattered in terms of how well they were able to um, get by. And that includes actually their children. Uh, parents who have disabilities, their, their children are remarkably adaptive and can help them in, in their parenting experience, at least as they grow old. Uh, and 
something else that we discovered was that parents are incredibly adaptive. Uh, everyone that I spoke to who had more than one child said, and this is pretty much true for parents across the board, that it was remarkably easier the second time, that a lot of their fears that they had before their first child were maybe not completely, but almost completely allayed by the time their second child was growing up. They learned different ways, different tips, different tricks in terms of how well to do it. And so we really need as a state to give more credit to the parents for being very good at discovering what it is that they need. And that means that we as a state need to talk to them about what services and supports they need, which is exactly what we did. Next slide, please. So here's the gaps that parents identified in Arizona. Now, there, there were several, right? Um, both in surveys, focus groups, and interviews. I'm not going to be able to go through all of them because that would be a bit of a waste of the time because there's probably over 50. But the three key ones, I apologize for that. The three key ones were that there's just, there's just not very much. Uh, nothing is systemic in terms of offered everywhere in the state, offered at every hospital. So even in, in local regions, even in hospitals, different clinicians have different services. Um, specifically OBGYN, and clinicians and nursing staff who help deliver children for parents with disabilities are not trained in how to work with them. And the inverse is also true. Clinicians who are trained in how to work with parents are not trained in how to counsel them when they're thinking about parenting or when they're raising their children. And many parents don't actually receive training or even advice from their clinicians or um, and they, they do receive, some receive training, it is offered, but it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, for example, sometimes by social workers, by NGO staff. Simply put, there's just nothing that's systemic that's offered in the state as a whole. Um, one of the key problems was that treatment facilities themselves may not be accessible. Uh, one interviewee reported that it was a personal relationship he had with an attending nurse that helped him help his wife in the delivery. His chair did not fit in the uh, in the delivery room, and so they had to come up with special um, accommodations just for him. And that was only because he knew the nurse. Uh, some mothers reported that there was difficulty in even holding their newborns because of the, the, the hospital beds that were just not accommodating for them with their disability. Um, a third gap, and this, is, this will come back time again, is that there was no real information on services, supports, or resources provided to parents before or even after their children were born. There are services and supports and resources but there's no single place where parents can go to look for them. Next slide, please. So here's what parents said we should do because of those gaps. First, clinicians should be trained in how to work with prospective and existing parents who have disabilities. That requires first and foremost that they need to take more time to listen to their concerns and capacities. We all understand the clinicians have very limited time. But the truth of the matter is that they need to give more time. They need to be allowed to give more time to parents who have disabilities so that they can talk to them and discover what it is that they need and want. Um, we need to have more accessible spaces and equipment. Every hospital does need to have some form of accessibility for delivery services. Um, and then also doctors and nurses and administrators and everyone in uh, medical care needs to use multiple communication modalities, especially for parents who may have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Doesn't mean that they can't understand, of course, but 
we simply need to explain in various ways to make sure that they understand exactly what, what clinicians are telling them, especially because when clinicians, I know for me as a person with a disability, when clinicians speak to me, I need them to explain it in different ways than they would with a normal patient. Okay. The second recommendation was that statewide support groups are badly needed. Um, most, I wouldn't, I would actually amend that, say almost all participants in our research, clinicians, professionals, and parents all said, we need support groups. They also said there are there are support groups for individuals with disabilities. There are support groups for parents, but there aren't really support groups for parents who have disabilities. That would help them throughout their child's life. Um, and nowadays, thanks to the pandemic, we are all well versed in doing what I'm doing right now, which is using Zoom to present, to speak to each other, to participate in these support groups. Online technology should be used to facilitate having parental support groups. There might not be enough for a support group in you know, a smaller city, but if you expand to the whole state, yes, there will be enough people. Um, third suggestion is that resource guides should be made available. Uh, these resource guides should go for, sorry, you can get something out of the way, need to go for all clinicians not just social workers. This was repeated by many participants that they needed to hear this information from the clinicians, not just from people who came in to work with them after they had delivered or as, as ancillary professionals. They wanted clinicians to explain this to them so that they would know that clinicians also have this information. Uh, they recommended that we should work this into continuing education programs for OBGYN and other, other clinicians, that they should have access to these resource guides and know how to use them with parents and prospective parents. Next slide, please. This was the, very, the top recommendation. Uh, everyone mentioned this, and several of them stressed it very strongly in interviews and focus groups. They want more information. And I don't mean that they want more information generally. They want more information in a single place, whether it be a website or a form or a series of forms or an information packet or something. They want resource, uh, they want information about resources and services, adaptive or special equipment. This is worth sitting on for a minute. Um, several individuals mentioned that. Most of the equipment that they needed that really helped them in their parenting, they had to get on their own. They had to find on their own. And more importantly, they had to order on their own from Europe. As in, it's just not, it, that that's not easy for someone who's dealing with being a new parent, right? To take the time to look up where they need to, research, to find these kinds of uh, adaptive equipments if they're not even in the US. So there needs to be some sort of listing where they could find it and then order it, right? Um, and then of course, support groups and mentors, peer mentors, especially, because most people said that they could have really benefited from, and some of them did actually benefit from knowing other individuals who have disabilities who's, who had been through the process before, especially when with their first child. Um, and actually, now that I think about it, even grandparents mentioned that they would like to speak to other grandparents who have disabilities about what grandparenting means. They also want some information about family planning for people who have disabilities. I, I think the largest, given how many people said this, thing that I would recommend for that is to say that just because you have a disability doesn't necessarily mean anything about what your abilities as a parent are going to be. Um, a lot of individuals expressed said that they had fears before parenting, but they quickly learned that they were just as capable of dealing with them as others. Um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities especially had difficulty with paperwork, and they would love some information about the kinds of things that are required for paperwork 
all the paperwork that is, has to be filled out because it is very overwhelming for a lot of parents who have disabilities. They also said, and this comes directly from a couple surveys, they want information about how to care for my baby. Um, that primarily is probably coming from first-time parents. But again, they need the information to allay those fears to the point where they can realize that they will probably be able to care for their baby just fine. They just need to learn, like all parents do. Um, they want information about where to find supplies. Or sometimes they actually want help financing those supplies. And this is true really wherever the individual lives in Arizona. Um, and there are definitely places in the state, given its unique geography, where those supplies are hard to find if you live in remote rural areas. Uh, they also want information about how to take care of themselves, such as self-care, especially for mental health. Things like postpartum depression, but also dealing with children as they grow up. Um, we have a lot of information, well, not a lot, but we have more information for parents of teenagers, right? But that doesn't mean that the adolescent years aren't also challenging. And so they would love some help with how to take care of themselves during those more challenging adolescent years. Um, they also said that early childhood, there's a lot of advice for early childhood. Again, but the adolescent years have challenges from both ages that they need help in learning with, especially first-time parents. And finally, they want information on the social services that are available in the state because there are many but there's no comprehensive single place to find information about or get referral, how to get referrals for these social services. Simply put, they need information. And of course, there were many, many, many more elements of the information that parents wanted. Uh, we will include that in our final report. But for now, for the interim findings, these are the most important bits of information that they wanted. And it's worth underlining again that the single most requested thing from parents who have disabilities, but then also from clinicians and professionals who work with them, is they need more information, uh, a one-stop shop, if you will, for all the information that parents need. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So anyways, uh, then I will be around to answer questions about any of these findings. Again, this is only preliminary findings. We haven't done a full analysis of the data, but we have done a preliminary analysis of the data. And it really spoke loud and clear about those three or well, four primary recommendations and the three primary gaps that parents and professionals and clinicians all identified. And of course, I will be around to answer any questions that you might have after we finish, but I will turn it over now to the panel. Um, now, the providers themselves said that they would like more educational resources and training. Um, in other words, it looks very similar to what parents themselves requested. Uh, they want more information about how to coordinate care. You know, there are many different providers who are involved when individuals you know, are, become pregnant, give birth, and then raise their children. Providers would like help uh, coordinating all of that care. They want more information about patients' individual disabilities. For instance, you know, maybe... Certain providers are trained in dealing with individuals with physical or mobility disabilities, but they don't necessarily have information for intellectual and developmental disabilities. In other words, clinicians just need some more, especially OBGYN clinicians, would like more training and more information about how to work with specific kinds of disabilities. And then finally, as a to help them support their patients. They want playing language, pictorial or video education options for their patients. In other words, things that they can give to patients. So it's not all on them with their limited amount of time. That explains many of the intricacies of becoming pregnant, giving birth and raising children, especially if you have disabilities. And these are all things that it is in our capacity to, to develop. We simply need to develop them and we need to provide them to the providers so they can give them to uh, 
two parents, prospective and current parents. Um, all right, that was, I believe that was the last slide. I, I apologize. Um, and I, of course, will be able to answer any questions that you have. And then we will, um, I believe JC said, we'll be going on a break. Thanks, Austin. Do we have any questions from the room before we take a break for Austin? Well, welcome back, everyone. My name is April Reed, and I'm the Vice President of Advocacy at Ability360. And it's been our pleasure to partner uh, with our friends and, and fellow colleagues um, to work on this project. Um, we have been together for many years now. And truly what brought us all together is the stories that we would hear as we served um, our consumers and our clients, um, parents talking to us about the services they needed. And we started reaching out to each other and saying, hey, have you heard of anything? Do you know of a resource? And um, as often happens uh, with change, we just said, hey, let's all sit together. And out of those conversations, we started meeting monthly, and we've done so now for many years. Um, out of those conversations, we really were able to explore um, what were the things we were hearing from community members and where were the gaps. And so uh, we're very grateful to that for that partnership. I, I think I speak for all of the partners as well when we say that we are so grateful um, to people like these who have stopped, have very busy schedules and filled out a survey and came to a focus group and just really openly and vulnerably shared their stories. And we're so grateful for all those people um, that have done that with us. It's just such a privilege to be able to hear from, from them. And, and also, you know, their enthusiasm for this work has carried it forward. So um, just please know how much we, uh, we appreciate that and are grateful to all of you for, for sharing with us today and, and through the surveys and the focus groups that have already happened. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. I'm going to be facilitating some questions with them. Panel, if you don't mind, I'm going to do uh, your interjection, uh, just your name, and then I'm going to ask that first question. Uh, first, we have John Bobian. And do you uh, want me to kind of go over? Nope, I just want you oh. to wave. Say hi. Hi, everybody. I'm John <laughs> Bobian. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Next, we have Polly Queen. Sharon Malone, and then joining us on Zoom is uh, Jade Muncie. Hi, Jade. All right, I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to ask the first question. We'll kind of go through in that order uh, for the first couple of questions, and then for the remaining questions, I'm just going to open it up to anybody who feels inspired or um, has a story or a thought that they want to share. So we'll go down the row. John, if we, if you will, will you share with us what's your disability and what does that mean for you? I have a rare form of muscular dystrophy called Miyoshi myopathy, um, and it's a progressive uh, disability. Um, I was born with it. Um, didn't know that I had it until I got to about 18, 19. That's when I started to show symptoms. At that time, I could still walk. Um, but eventually I needed a transition to a power chair full time. Um, and my muscles continue to decrease in strength over time. So that means I'm constantly adapting to my environment. Thank you, John. Polly, what is your disability and what does that mean for you? So I have a cognitive learning disability. And what does that mean to me? I only comprehend a quarter of what I read and I have three forms of dyslexia. So for me, it takes a lot of time being patient, having to read things over and over and over again, and not being afraid to ask what it actually means. So that's what it means for me. Thank you. Sharon? And um, I am a T5 paraplegic from a car accident 11 years ago. Um, and the disability to me is really, um, this is only an extension of, this wheelchair is just an extension of my legs. It is not anything that's a barrier 
that I can't do and anything that anybody else wants to do. Thank you, Sharon. And Jade, uh, for you, what is your disability and what does that mean to you? Yep, I have autism. I'm a self-advocate. Um, what that means to me is that I have a different way of seeing the world and a unique perspective um, on the world. And sometimes that causes difficulty in communication and sensory overload. That's what it means okay. to me. John, tell us, how many kids do you have, and what are their ages? Uh, my wife and I have raised two awesome boys. Um, my youngest is 12, and the oldest is 13 in the teenager years. So it's uh, <laughs> it, it's uh, exciting and frightening all at the same time. And then, Polly, what about you? How many kids? How many All righty. So I have... Three children, uh, two um, boys and a, and a lovely daughter. Um, I have one son that's 41, one that's 40, and then the daughter is 38. I have five grandchildren. Oldest is, and that's four grandsons, one granddaughter. Um, I have a 19-year-old grandson, two soon-to-be 17-year-old grandsons, a um, 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. The granddaughter's the youngest, 10 years old. That was a long one. Uh, I have three children. Um, they were two, four, and seven at the time of my injury, but now they are the lovely 13, 15, and 19. So 13 and 15 girls. Whew. That's a whole statement in itself, but then, of course, 19 is not any better with a boy. So, um, but yes, that's my too. Thank you, Sharon. And Jade, yep, I you, have how many children? Yep, I have three boys. Um, my oldest is seven, and I have a three-year-old, and then I have this little three-month-old. Um, and my oldest has autism as well, and he also has muscular dystrophy as well. So. Thank you. We're so happy to have that cute little guest with us. Thank you for sharing him. I'll open this question up to, to all of you um, to think about um, what has been helpful in your parenting journey. Um, and, and that could may, maybe be resources or supports or technology, equipment, people. But what's really supported and lifted you in this experience and journey of being a parent? And I'll let anyone who, who would like to, to start there. John? Okay. So the things that have been useful. Mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, doctor's offices have been um, pretty open and accessible so that I can bring my chair in there and join my wife um, when we were in the doctor's offices. Um, there's a seatbelt on this chair that I never use, um, but when I had my kids, it was pretty vital because um, I have the strength issues with my arms. I used the seatbelt to kind of lock my my kid in here in my lap, um, and that was very helpful so that I could kind of hold my kids and get around. Um, that was the primary way that I was able to take them places and do things. Um, I've also had a vehicle modified. Um, I was using folk rehab so that I can drive on my own and take my kids places. Um, that was has been really useful. Um, and also there was uh, some modifications done to my home, uh, adding some door hinges that expand how far the doors open in my home so I can get in and to my kids in their bedroom. Um, before those uh, door hinges, I wasn't able to get into the room to my kids. Anybody else? Resources, support, people, technology, things that have helped you? For me, I'll go ahead. So 
my children, there wasn't a whole lot of resources. Um, and so there wasn't, I couldn't go to Google like I can with the grandkids. Um, so it was relying on individuals that you already knew that had raised children or was going through a pregnancy. Um, I was fortunate that because of the way I learn and I have to read things over and over again, and for those that do not understand what dyslexia is, it's doing things backwards. And so for me, I had to get over the fear of asking a lot of questions. So I was very fortunate that going to the doctor, I mean, I asked a lot of questions. So I'm feeling like this, what does that mean? And so forth. So that was during my pregnancy and then relying on and asking people questions. Um, with the grandchildren, it's been a little bit easier because, you know, Google and Chrome and so forth. So if I wanted to understand something that they were going through, I could either look up, you know, a article um, by a psychologist, social worker, so forth, or I could actually Google, you know, oh my goodness, I have a teenager that's, you know, 14 years old and they're acting like this. It's this uh, is this for the par? So I can relate very much to what you're saying, Sharon. Um, so that are the, those were the resources that I was able to use pre and. Um, I really, yeah, I didn't have the support. I mean, if, aside from family, um, who were able to support and help, like bathing the children and, and so forth, that I had to rely on with with family because there wasn't the adaptation. Um, initially going on, but I did get an accessible vehicle um, 10 months post-injury, so that made it much more helpful to be able to take my kids to places where, just like every other kid, um, be able to go play in sports and, and dance and all the other things that they needed. Um, I was also fortunate enough to, to partner up with the Arizona Spinal Cord Association um, because they had community events. And then I could see that there were other, you know, activities that I could do um, post-injury. So I was able to take them doing water sports um, and kayaking and skydiving and um, things like that. So camping, I was able to take my kids there because of the Spinal Cord Association. So that was nice to be able to partner with that. Um, to be able to, you know, get out into the community. But I had no, and and we'll all say this, and it, it goes across the board, there is no book to be, uh, to, to be you know, a parent. You really have to wing it um, as it is, just thinking outside the box um, as you would any, as a, a, a regular parent, not with someone without a disability, so... And then, Jade, for you, anything that's been helpful in your journey as a parent? Yes. Um, even though I do work for them now, I will say the Autism Society was very helpful. That One of the first things that I found with them was the parent peer support group. <clears throat> and while they're not, all the parents aren't um, autistic, they'll have or some understanding of autism. And so that was helpful. Um, and finding that community in them had been very helpful. And, yeah, they're also very accommodating for sensory things and um, clear communication with them as well. So that was probably one of the most helpful things. And it was challenging because when I first became a parent, I lived in Cochise County and there's almost no resources for autism there, um, which made it really difficult. So the concept of that, of the Zoom meetings is definitely an interesting concept for sure, where you can reach some of the more rural areas. Thank you, Jade. Next question, what have some of the challenges been? Um, what have some of the barriers uh, that you've faced uh, in your parenting experience? Um, once I got to where I needed to go with my vehicle, had trouble um, transferring my kids out of the car seat and um, like taking them places when they were really small and they couldn't kind of help me out. Um, I always had thought it would be great if there was a stroller with like four swivel wheels that would somehow connect, you know, lightweight and would connect to my chair so that I could just start driving and they would be right there with me in the stroller. 
but I couldn't really find anything that did that. Um, so, you know, taking them places at a very young age was very difficult. It was when they could start climbing up on my lap and I could like buckle them in that that's when it really got better. Um, also, you know, in, there were times where I wanted to take my kids out of the crib, but didn't have like a crib that was more low to the ground where it could open up the side of the crib and, and get access so I could, um, get to my kids. Um, so something like that would have been nice. And on the flip side for doctor's offices, there were a few doctor's offices I couldn't get into. And so I kind of had to wait outside while my wife went in with the doctor and I couldn't get in and be with her to experience part of that. Um, or in some instances I was able to get in, but it was like so tight that I kind of, I was almost at the door. Um, so that was a little frustrating. Um, I'm sure probably for, for women trying to uh, get access to beds and stuff, if you have limited strength and dexterity, uh, might be hard to transfer to some of those beds or different equipment. Um, I know I have issues um, transferring to some, getting different scans, et cetera, so that might be an issue as well. For me, when you're asking what are my challenges, it's making sure what I read, I actually understand. When you're making formula, am I actually making it correctly? When I'm uh, uh, administering medication, am I actually looking at it and understanding what it say? Don't do it backwards, you give them too much or too little. So it was a constant reminder of everything I read and had to do forms filling out, you know, going to the school and making sure the immunization records were correct. Everything took me just a little bit longer and making sure that it was actually correct. And then not being afraid to say, hey, okay, am I doing this right? You know, and then learning to trust yourself. Okay, I got this. So that was my challenge. Like I said, everything took me two or three times longer. And that was all right. I learned to be, to do things early. Um, some of the barriers that I faced was, especially when they were in school, um, there were, and, and, and this goes for further than that, but the, the accessibility in their playgrounds at school, they were sand, of course, and there was no way that I could get over sand. So it would be like, bye, you know, and just run off to the playground, which they were fine with. Um, but it was a barrier for me because I wanted to be there just like any other parent would be. Um, so maybe even the doors in the schools, they weren't accessible or have an accessible door. So trying to open those doors, you know, you had to kind of learn how to do that. Um, I did advocate for that for them to, you know, put um, in a more inclusive um, playgrounds, so that was good, but it is something I had to advocate for. Um, expanding that even in parks, all the parks that you go to in their in your neighborhoods, or you know, even some of the public um, parks, they're just they have the same thing. They have the sand or those little wood chips, which are not you know not great. Um, so I always, they had to climb up. I'm like, well, if you're going to climb up, you're going to have to get yourself down because I can't get to you. And that was very frightening that I had to rely on someone else to be able to do that. Um, yes, I had the same kind of barriers that, you know, getting into facilities and they have to move the chairs out for, you know, because they're not, um, there's too many, you know, chairs in there. So for me to be able, they had to make an accommodation to me, which is not something you you know, want for to, you know, have to face. Um, I just want to be treated just like anybody else. So that was barriers as well. That, and yes, the accessibility on having, a, I had to get a smart drive to be able to go over those grassy fields, those soccer fields, those football fields, those, you know, basketball courts. I had to be in a specific, they don't have bleachers, couldn't go up into the bleachers. I'd have to be up front. Um, because they didn't have any other space or I'd have to go to the side because those bleachers don't have even spaces um, to be able to just uh, like a handicapped space. So 
things like that, are, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, as of, they've gotten older, it has been a little bit more challenging. Each each stage of their lives has always been a different barrier. So that's just some of them. And then Jade, for you, any challenges that you've faced in your parenting experience? Um, yeah, I think uh, I can think back to my firstborn, especially in having difficulties with doctors. Um, a lot of like he he had issues, um, like he had stuff with his neck and I would keep bringing them up to the doctors and people not listening to me and not trusting my instinct. I don't know if it's because of what social cues I was giving or or I'm not sure what was happening, but it was very difficult to find people that would listen to me about my children and whether or not they thought I was smart enough to have those conversations or those ideas were something that was difficult during that time. Um, and then obviously the more children I have, the more I, I know that you just have to kind of trust your gut sometimes and keep keep fighting for your kids and that's for every parent um but yeah that is definitely something that I'd, I'd struggle with all the way up into also my third um I was I had self-disclosed to the midwife team that I was on the spectrum and at times they it almost made them feel like I knew myself made it seem like I knew myself less because they thought maybe I I wasn't sure what was happening while I was going through labor and I kept having to advocate for myself I did know what was happening I did know um and at the end of that experience uh, one of the midwives even apologized to me and said like they were impressed with how well I, I knew my own body and my own self and that was kind of interesting to me a hit or miss but um I was happy that they apologized but it was just interesting to to kind of hear that someone thought that maybe I wouldn't even have known my own body just because of having uh, being on the spectrum. But yeah, so those have been some of the challenges with uh, parenting. Also, having issues with uh, social communication, um, knowing how to like especially with my firstborn again how what social cues he's supposed to be hitting and how I can help him with that sometimes hard especially when we lived in a environment where there was less social opportunities um, and I had less family around to help with those social interactions were definitely some struggles um, for that as far as the autism aspect goes and then obviously there's a lot of sensory things with having children that everyone suffers with. <laughs> mom, 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 stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Learning how to get those things under control. Thank you, Jade. Well, uh, Jade just really highlighted our, our next question, which is uh, what have your experience been both positive and negative with professionals? Um, you know, you, we all have to engage with, with systems and professionals and that can, can bring successes and challenges. What have your experiences been with that? I was going to say that I really haven't had any issues with professionals. Um, I do sometimes like get with people in general, they kind of look at me and then they might like give any kind of papers or information over to my wife. Um, so in that case, you know, that doesn't feel good because, you know, in, you may think the person is seeing you as someone who may not be capable to kind of understand. And so that's a little frustrating. But other than that, I'd, I don't think I really experienced any major issues with professionals. Um, they're usually willing to accommodate if they can um, in situations. Probably just the, the biggest barrier I've experienced is just accessibility in general. For me, um, uh, what's my experience with professionals? I've had positive, negative, like I'm sure of the, uh, all that your kid uh, attest to. But for me, it was if I didn't understand a question or something they were explaining to me and I asked them why again and had to ask them to say it in a different way, 
they sometimes would get to the point of where um, they would talk down to me. And it's like, no, it's not that I don't understand. I just need you to explain it in a different way. Or if my spouse would come in with me, um, they would talk to him as if I wasn't there. And that was really difficult. And I'd have to remind them, hey, 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 I'm right here. You know, you can talk to me. Um, And so those were my, and then you had others that understood, okay, I'll explain it to you in a different way. And it was great. So I've had both positive and negative. For the most part, I've really had pretty good experience with professionals on accommodation-wise um, to be able to, you know, get into the offices and so forth. But <clears throat> I think that um, sometimes they don't think I understand. Yeah, like I understand. And I have to very much advocate for it. No, no, no. I, I, I think I know more than you. I probably could be a doctor at this point after all that I've gone through. <laughs> So no, I think this is what the best course of action is for for my kid. And they don't think that I would understand that. Um, So I think that's kind of been a challenge and it's, you know, not the best of, you know, experiences when you have that. Um, But I, like, I do know what I'm, I do know what I'm talking about. And, um, but for the most part, like, yeah, like we've all said, it's pretty, they've been pretty good about making the rooms accessible or, but they, you know, it's almost as if you're, oh, let me, you know, let me help or let me get the door. I'm like, I can get those for you, not not the other way around. Um, but they don't, they just think they need to help more. And that's, sometimes they are, they're just trying to be helpful. I know, you know, that, and that's great. It's just sometimes you just want them to like, I'll, if I need something, I will ask for help instead of versus just automatically assuming that I need help. Kate, anything else you wanted to add? The story you shared uh, was so powerful. Um, Working with the professionals as you were giving birth, anything else you'd like to add for that question? Um, I think it's just, again, it's so difficult because every person you meet with is going to be different and every doctor is different. So yes, I've had some negative experiences um, before, especially just with, in general, since I've been a child, doctors not listening or believing. Like, I don't know, like if I'm sick, why do I feel this way? Oh, that's anxiety. (laughs) Or like not being able to help me because of the maybe the autism and the social communication issues. Um, But usually I I know that that is, at least from where I work now, we talk about the double empathy problem of people who don't have autism don't like to try to change the way that they're saying it. Instead, it's like, I have to try to catch up and learn or I have to try to catch up and figure out how can I present myself so that you will listen to me or you will believe me instead of them kind of, just listening, being more understanding and opening that um, opportunity has been, that's the struggle I find with most doctors. Um, but like I said, I, I do, I've seen like slowly a change. Um, like I said, with the midwife team, they were a little more understanding to um, want to make those accommodations. Uh-oh. And um, that those accommodations of of being more clear uh, trying to give me a little bit more heads up of what the what the room's going to look like, stuff like that. Um, especially with autism, the having a good understanding of what is going to happen, um, who am I going to meet with, what doctor am I going to have, those things can be a struggle. And unfortunately, like with the midwife team, I had a different doctor every single time. And then going towards actually being in labor, I'm going to have an even a brand new doctor that I've never even met with while in labor, just because that's how the system works, um, which is unfortunate. But I will say I was able to adapt and they're able to read my file and see, okay, she has this, she, she might need some accommodations. What can we do to make her feel most comfortable in a, oh, my lights went up, in a time where I'm most vulnerable while about to give birth. Um, it, yeah, it's a lot. There's lots of different struggles with that as far as like giving birth and, and things like happening there, but having doctors who are willing to listen to you and understand you and take that 
take that second beat to not just prejudge something and be able to actually listen to your opinion, um, whether you're pregnant, giving birth, or just trying to advocate for your child at the same time. Go ahead, John. I know we're already past this question from earlier, but I feel like it's important. I just thought of it. Um, from my personal experience being in the hospital, um, I've noticed a lot of the hospitals, um, for one, the staff don't seem to have as much education on Hoyer lifts. Um, and I've been in several different hospitals and they typically only have like one Hoyer lift in the entire hospital. And then they have trouble finding it, like digging it out from somewhere. Um, and that's pretty important for somebody who's not able to transfer themselves. Um, it's a safety issue. And so I think that really needs to be addressed for people with disabilities who need the assistance transferring. Anyways. Thank you. We've, we've talked a little bit at, at, about stigma and stereotypes just if you, as you've shared some stories, but um, how do you navigate that when you're encountering some of that stereotype or that stigma in the community? Um, how do you navigate that and, and what advice do you give to others about dealing with that and, and remaining a self-advocate when you are um, encountering those barriers of stigma? Use it as like a point of education. So if somebody does something that seems a little bit off, just kind of explain to them, you know, oh, I see that, you know, you're, you're doing this, or um, actually, this is what I prefer. Um, so if a person does come up and say, uh, would you like assistance opening the door? And I'm like, thanks for asking, instead of just doing, like giving me the option to choose, to be able to open the door on my own if I want to, or for them to help me out with that. Um, that's kind of what I do. Um, or if somebody, I, this is probably a little off topic, but if somebody kind of with their kids come up to me and they're like, no, don't talk to them uh, or don't talk, don't bother that disabled person. Um, you know, I use it as an opportunity to just like go and talk to them, an educational moment for the kid and then the, the parent. Um, so if any anything comes up where I'm feeling um, uncomfortable or something's not accessible, then I'll usually talk to the staff to say, hey, this door, uh, this doctor's office, is really heavy. There's no button here. Um, it's hard for me to open on my own. It'd be great if you guys were able to add that accommodation and like add a button there so it's accessible for everybody. Just things like that. For me with the stigma and so forth, it was always the question of how did you get here or, you know, wow, you've come a long way. How did you do that? You can take that as a positive or negative. I chose to take it as a positive. As John said, it's an educational moment of explaining that, you know, you uh, ask questions, you don't give up. Um, when you're raising children and you already understand that they're going to have homework and they're bringing homework home and you already have an issue yourself of, oh, my goodness, I've got to read this 20 times before I can explain to them how to do the actual problem. You know, I, I learned early on that I needed to become really good friends with their teachers, and I took the opportunity to volunteer to be in the classroom so that I could learn how to educate and teach my children the method that they were using, so, because it was difficult for me. So, you know, and the advice is you just, you never give up. You just, you know, keep keep moving forward and 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 figure out a way, all of us here, you will find we'll have figured out ways to do what we needed to do, so. Yeah, I think I saw a lot of the stigmatism when they were younger, and I did end up going on those field trips, and so the kids that actually got to see me do more, even though I was a cool, I was a cool mom, because I had the cool van that came, ramp came down, why are you in a car like that, mom? Um, and I was able to go, especially with the smart drive, um, I was able to go faster than most people. I'm like, peace out. Um, so
So they started to learn that I could be quicker. I could be, you know, I am just as capable of throwing a football. I am better at, you know, I would, I would be on that basketball court shooting hoops with my son. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm no three-pointer, but, you know, I could still shoot. But they didn't realize that I could do that. And so I would be, okay, you got to circle around me. I mean, I've been able to, you know, get him or, you know, stuff like that. But I, I would be able to participate on the field um, or on the, the playground. So, okay, I, that, was a, that was a little bit of a challenge for people too. But once they got to see me do it more and more and more, then they were able to, you know, not ask for, you know, do I need assistance? And, um, yes, the doors, I would always, I would get to the door. I mean, they'd always ask first, Hey, can I get, you know, I'll get the door. I'll get the door for you is usually what they, you know, start with. Um, and then it became like, can I, you know, help you with a door? And then they saw me as, okay, she's getting that door. (laughs) Um, so, and I would hold it open for them to, to get that stigmatism, like, I'm holding the door for you, you know, I would go first. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it is an education process for sure, but the more repetitive that they see you do things, then the more you get to understand, okay, she is definitely capable of, and just like anybody else, she's capable of doing uh, what other parents are doing. So, um, and so some of the parents, yeah, did have to overcome that as well to see how do I act? I don't, they don't know how should I act, you know, around um, myself. And I'm like, you just treat me like any other, other parent. Um, I can do everything they they can do. They just, I've got to do it differently. That's all. So. Oh, can you repeat the question for me? Sure. So Jade, um, we talked a little bit about dealing with uh, with stigma and stereotypes. How have you navigated that, and and what is your advice to others in dealing with stigma and stereotypes that they might face? I think uh, finding community and people that understand are, is one of the best things that for me anyway. And whenever people come into the into the office or or I meet people who also have autism or whose kids have autism. I just tell them to like, try to really get connected with people who, who understand. So you don't feel as isolated, um, surround yourself with, with uh, just that love and support. I think that's my best advice for that. Obviously I talked about some of the other stigma stuff with doctors and um, you can bring an advocate if you need someone, if you, have a spouse who can help you or um, just someone who understands autism more might be able to help navigate the differences between maybe the doctors and you. Um, Something like that might be helpful. That's all I have for that. Great. Thank you. So we're we're hitting the final last last couple of questions. Um, what do you see as next for this community of parents with disabilities? What's needed? And, you know, if you had that, that kind of dream of what you would have wished you would have had, what do you envision for this community as, as a, a resource and, and a way that uh, we can address those needs going forward? I'll answer that real quick. For me, just plain language, and it benefits so many individuals. You know, keep it simple, keep it plain. I'm talking medical, you know, talking legal. Uh, I'm telling you sometimes to fill out forms, it's a nightmare. And, you know, for me, it's like, okay. So plain language is needed. Keep it simple. I think it would be nice if there was sort of a central resource online as like a website that kind of covers topics. Um, that people with various types of disabilities experience and how they might be able to handle them or different uh, resources available online and maybe some uh, like educational courses with like different technology that people can try out when they're considering having kids and go, 
oh, you know what? I think I can do this because I, I know that there's this accessible stroller or crib or um, this resource at this organization that can help me with that so that I can be more active in the community with my kids. Um, it'd be great if there was like a central resource for that. Um, yeah. I, I definitely second that and I'm sure third that. Um, having the one location, it is it's starting from the beginning, even finding the OBGYN and the list of you know professionals that are in that in that particular area that could deal with that. Um, talking about accessible parks, um, so that you're not searching for and getting into that situation where you don't have accessibility into that um, you know into that area. Um, and then you know it is the accessible. I just had my kids you know since they were the youngest was two. Is able to tr transition more into the bed, uh, but there is accessible cribs. I have, you know, several mentors that have that problem, and um, there is now getting to be a little bit more. Sometimes they just, you know, they don't. You want to have that list of, hey, here's where I can get this, you know, adaptive equipment. Here's where I can get this adaptive equipment, and sometimes it's looking on, you know. Uh, being able to have it and see it in person, you know, before you buy it because nothing's cheap and it's not exactly having a disability, you know, you have sometimes have more financial struggles. And so um, being able to test those out would be, you know, great to have. But from all the different links, all in one place would be, you know, phenomenal for somebody it's just, and it wouldn't be so overwhelming and you weren't looking for this site to go find this and this site, you know, to go to that. We're very fortunate to have the, the Google and everything that we have now, but they're in so many different places. And so you have to search and, and it's very, very difficult to find. So I think that would be, if I had a wish list, that would be the number one. And then Jade will will let you go next to say what do you see is needed next for this community of parents with disabilities and um, yeah, just reiterating some of the other stuff. No, nobody has ever hurt from more resources and more inclusivity. So just continuing that and and continuing the. <clears throat> things like this, getting more ideas and concepts from people and having more resources available or, um, yeah, I, I think I just reiterate that. I think I'd like to add also like, um, education for professionals in the hospitals and doctor's office. So they understand, you know, the sensitivity and being able to treat people respectfully and as inclusively as possible and uh, maybe set some standards for some of the equipment for some of the places so that, you know, anyone could go and get the service that they need as they're trying to get those services. Um, I think that would be really helpful. Aaron, another thought? Yeah, I have one. I'm one as I think of it. Having this support group, um, I mean, I do mentor, and that's why, um, like, the Reed Foundation will send me mothers, you know, that are um, to peer mentor as because they're not sure of, you know, what to do. Um, I've been able to get them out traveling. So having a support group to say, hey, I went to Disney, you know, Disneyland, and you just had to do da 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 da. Um, there's wheelchair accessible, you know, um, power beach chairs. If you want to go to San Diego, I can tell you where to, you know, get a, a power wheelchair that you can go on the beach with. Um, so once I once I told her all the things that she could do. You know, she's just thinking that she couldn't take her kids this place and she couldn't take her kid that place. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Yes, you can take them to this place and that place. And I've taken them more places than, you know, most have. 
and you think of those kayaking or the things that, you know, there are, you know, the ability to do that. Hey, you know, if I could tell you, hey, we're having a camp with a ramp this, you know, this weekend. Oh, you are? We, I can do this? And then, yes, you can do that with your kids. Um, your kids are more than welcome to do that. They, they love those water sports, let me tell you. Um, so just going out in the boat and, and things like that. So I was able to do that just but if as a, you know, as a mentor. So support groups are very, very much needed so you can, parents can talk to other parents that have already gone through the experience or had to face that challenge in that particular place. Oh, well, you know, I, I suggest if you want an accessible park, here's, at, here's the best one to go to. So something like that would be very, very helpful for some, you know, some parents that just are getting to talk to other parents. That community of peers. Thank you, panel. Uh, with that, I'll open it up. Is there anybody in the audience that, that has a question that they would like to ask our panel? Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, I wanted to ask from the perspective of a parent that's raising a child with a disability and because we work with families, you know, birth all the way into adulthood at raising special kids and what we really try to instill in them are high expectations rather than be deficit focused. And so if you had any advice to give to a young family that's raising a child, you know, what, what kind of advice would you give to that parent to help instill in them this strength-based philosophy and, and, and knowledge and helping them dream for the future to be that they can be a, a parent someday? So if you had any advice to give to a young family that's raising a child with a disability, what advice would you give them? Um, I would say finding the support, you know, the support um, depending on the disability and, and community because you do find that there is a community out there that has, if you get involved, then the kids see, okay, I can, they can do it. I mean, maybe I, I can do it. And so, and then you find ways that, okay, they, they can kind of troubleshoot. That's what parenting is all about. That's parenting 101 is troubleshooting. And so even if that, that parent might not have um, a specific thing, just because I have, you know, I don't have spasms like most people have spasms, but they may be the same level as me. I might not have the exact same things that are going on but I could think outside the box because I've talked to other people that is going to give me the same, you know, like, oh, well, I have an idea. You can use this as a, you know, adaptive, you know. So the more that they see that they can be inclusive, um, it's the more happier they're going to be and think that, I, yes, I can dream that I can do it. They've got to see it to, you know, and hear it that they can do it. Um, so it's just, they just got to do it in a different way. So finding those, you know, other places is the best thing that, that you can find. Anyone else want to add to what Sharon has yeah. said? I would say um, to learn your child and their specific special, whether it's special interest, whether it's um, their strengths, learn who they are without the disability in general, whether it is a part of them or not, but but what they like, what they are, and use those things and, and don't listen to everyone else sometimes. Like, I just think for myself with, with my son and his autism, I had people saying, you know, he may never be a doctor, but maybe he'll be happier and, and stuff like that. And now he's growing up and he's saying he wants to be a doctor. And who am I to say he can't? And who is anyone else to say he can't until he proves it himself? If that's what he wants, then I'm going to encourage him to, you know, teach him say, well, if you want to be a doctor, you got to do math at school, right? And there are still realities in that, but I can teach him like, or I can treat him like I would any other child who has dreams and uh, ultimately it's going to be up to him and what he wants. And there goes my lights again. Um, and just be there to help support him and advocate for him when I can. And 
just, yeah, I think that's going to be with every, every parent, right? You're going to have to look at your child's strengths and their challenges and go from there and, and how you want to support them and their unique perspective in life for, for who they are individually and, and their beautiful aspects and their challenges. That's going to be for all of my children, including my child with disability. Any other questions for the panel? Yes. Uh, hi, um, I have a question and it might deviate a bit from what we've been talking about, but uh, representation in media is a topic that really interests me. And so I was wondering uh, if you consider representation in kids media specifically of disabilities to be really important thing that you would like to uh, see like more children grow up with representation of different disabilities? I think it's very important to kind of show examples of uh, people living in the community and being successful. And there's a variety of stories of people with various different disabilities and the more that information gets out there to the community, the more they see what people are capable of and it, it removes a lot of those like stereotypes and stigmas and um i think it's really important to get that information out there in all all avenues is that kind of what you were wondering yeah okay i think that's it's really interesting because i think of like the good doctor and there's a lot more um, stuff coming out with people with autism. And again, you, you have to just feel like everyone is so different and it's great to see more diversity. And then also again, uh, uh, know that not everyone is going to be like that. And some people might be like that. And some people might want to go to the beach and some people might not want to go to the beach. And even if you can, it doesn't mean you have to force someone again. So it's going to be this whole, like everyone is just so different and so unique. And the more that we, just emphasize people's greatness and all of their diversity, it's going to benefit, I think, all of society. So even if that's in media and TV shows and stuff like that as well, I think that benefits society to be more inclusive, more kind, more understanding. I will add, though, that there's some education that needs to be done, especially in the news and um, in other areas where you know, they need that additional education, you know, people first language or allowing a person to identify themselves instead of identifying them. Um, and, you know, how they portray a person with a disability, like different camera angles, et cetera. Um, a lot of that, you know, there's, there really needs to be some educational moments um, with language and how a person's portrayed in the media. Um, you know, they might say somebody suffered from something instead of survived or um, I'm sure April knows all about that stuff. But um, that's a really important piece, too, because that can change a person's perspective on a person with a disability in the community and how that's all phrased and said. Thank you, John. Thank you, Polly. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Jade. We so appreciate your time and your willingness to share with all of us. Can we give them a round of applause? And I'm going to turn this over to JC, and we're going to have some time to share as a group um, as we kind of have digested the presentation from Dr. Um, Duncan and from our group. Um, we'll ha we now have some time to kind of share with each other. Thank you, April, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, what we'd like to now move into is open this up really into just a group discussion that we can all have. Um, so this can be a discussion for the whole group. Um, we Now that you've heard uh, a little bit about I forgot, Cam, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to stand. I think we're going to have it so it'll go out so we can see the group maybe talking. I don't know. I may also need some help uh, uh, with running the mic if we need to for some of this discussion because otherwise we won't hear it on the recording or for any of our folks who are online. Um, and so 
what we want to do is just have a discussion based now that you've heard a little bit about the project that we've been engaging with and some of um, what we've heard from the community through surveys and uh, focus groups and interviews and all of the great um, information, experience, powerful experiences that our panelists shared. You know, we want to hear from you, like, what are some of your thoughts around this? Where, um, what are the other resources or other things that you've heard that might really impact the parenting experience for folks with disabilities and how we can um, kind of move forward, take that next step, right? Because We've heard a lot of experiences and stories, but now our goal is to develop some of those resources and tools and educational materials to get out there to the greater community. And so this is a great opportunity for us to discuss what that might really look like. What do y'all want to see? We heard some, some examples of that shared today, um, but the more guidance we have from our community the better to ensure that we're actually addressing the needs and what people want and want to see. Okay. So, you know, what resources, maybe you've heard of a resource that wasn't shared today, or you've heard from others experience that's really needed that wasn't shared today. What are we missing? I feel like one of the things we learned that came out loud and clear in Austin's sharing of his findings in the focus groups and the conversations with folks is also that from, again, I'm thinking from that um, earlier parent perspective that we had a really, really hard time getting parents to feel comfortable having conversations about this. And so as an organization that serves parents, I think what we've learned is there's a need to provide parents a platform or some training or some community support that is all around having normalized dialogues about their children possibly being a parent whenever they become a grown up. And so I think that's something we learned um, from this work and so what that looks like going forward, I think that will unfold. But, you know, as we, as we have a generation of young people growing up, we want to empower them to feel, you know, really confident in their ability to become a parent if they want to. So how do we shore up parents with enough comfortable conversations, normalizing these conversations, and then also surrounding them with clinicians that will have these normalized conversations too and not think of it as a taboo or no, that's not going to be something for your future. So I think that's something that we learned and um, hopefully we can continue to develop some more healthy dialogue around that. Thank you. Hi, this is John Bobian. Uh, I just thought of this, and I think it would be kind of cool. Um, maybe some sort of big conference event uh, where multiple organizations come together and um, maybe even some physicians or people in the professional community come together um, and other organizations with, like, adaptive equipment to all geared around parenting um, where people from the community could come together with various types of disabilities and ask the questions that they have and feel more comfortable doing it because everybody's here for the same reason. Um, that might be kind of interesting. I don't think anyone's ever done something like that. Um, and that might be like a first time thing to you know, at least get something going might be interesting. Great. Thank you. That's a, that's a great idea. And while this is not quite what you're talking about, because I like the idea of bringing all of those kind of different community stakeholders together for that, um, 
one thing we can share with the group is that there is a plan for there to be a whole um, strand at NAU's Northern Arizona's Institute for Human Development um, Evidence for Success Conference, where um, there will be four sessions focused on um, different aspects around pregnancy and parenting with a disability, which is a first, which I think is a great first step and thinking of where we can kind of build something more and get more interest and awareness for an event like you're talking about. It's just something that I have experienced. I am part of the U of A's um, community peer monitoring program where I'm actually teaching PT, OT, physician, PAs, um, and future physicians, um, I go to the PTOD and medical schools to teach them about when they do have to go through that neuro and brain um, part of their schooling to let them know here are the issues that we face, here's what I do, to, you know, here's how I do home modifications, et cetera. So that really is, I'm hoping, is is going to educate them in the future to treat, you know, their patients and letting them know that they're they're going to have some challenges and they need to gear it not just as a whole, okay, this might be someone with a spinal cord injury or this might be a brain injury and this is how it's a one size fits all. It's not. Every individual is different. So I've tried to instill that in them that, they have to really listen to them and really take the time to get to know them and get to know they really know their own bodies and to listen to that. So I think that's great. And yes, um, there is the Abilities Expo that comes every year. It's not necessarily geared all to, you know, parenting and pregnancy, et cetera, but it would be good if we could add those kind of vendors to that, it does have some things, you know, for kids because you don't see a lot with the kids. Uh, and so, you know, having them come to those and going to those expos is important too, but to, to include those vendors so that they can get resources as well and being out there, you getting it all, really getting it all in one place. And that's, um, I believe, in September of this year. So um, they've been here every year, and it's at Westworld in Scottsdale. So um, I highly suggest that as well. But we do try at the Spinal Cord Association as well to have a conference every year. We aren't this year, but, you know, every you know, other year we're thinking of just we bring in vendors specifically around the community so that people can pick up information. Thank you. And if... Um Anyone who's online, if you have thoughts or want to share anything, please feel free to, to unmute. Um, you know, we mentioned a lot about education quite a bit um, as part of the panel comments and a training that's both training and educational materials. What are some thoughts, directions that folks hear based on what you've heard today? that you think might be really useful or where I feel like there's so much that needs to be done, right? So how can we prioritize some of that based on what uh, uh, our communities think? Hi, my name is Erica. I am um, a social worker, but I work with um, the Northern Arizona USED that was mentioned, Institute for Human Development and I'm on a team that will actually be doing one of the presentations as part of the Parenting with Disabilities strand at the conference in June. But I think the thing that um, I keep hearing from uh, parents that we've been able to work with as part of our project in here today is this constant um, idea that people know what they need and that that needs to be prioritized and listened to with patients and that that, that idea needs to be more embedded in um, professional curriculum, um, specifically in medicine because, and I've worked in a variety of hospitals over the year as a social worker and that comes up over and over and over again 
that this distrust that an individual, that a patient, that a person with a disability doesn't really know, um, but in fact they do. We all know what we need and that if, I think it's a really like big broad concept that I'm mentioning. Um, I don't really have a practical implementation in mind, but um, if that could be more in the core of some of these professions, I think it could go a really long way because I know that that's true for social work and they kind of drill that in us really early on. People know what they need and it's your job to listen and hear it and move forward. But I, I've seen repeatedly um, that that's not the case in a lot of other uh, professions. So. Thank you. Other thoughts? My Pers this is John. Uh, my personal opinion, uh, if we're talking about priorities, uh, I think, you know, when we needed the most help was when we were um, first thinking of having kids and had kids um, and they were very young and needed the extra care. Um, that's when we needed it the most at the very beginning. So I'm thinking it might be good to start with like the medical professionals um, to give them information and resources and go over some standards of practice and accommodations and how to listen to people, um, all of that so that people at least have a starting point. People with disabilities who are going in and thinking or thinking of having kids or having kids, um, having those resources at that source before you get into everything else, uh, I think would be really useful. Like if we went to a facility and they're like, oh yeah, you know, did you know about these things you could take advantage of or utilize as a new parent with a disability? Um, that would have been great to like know right off the bat from, from those places. Um, and then eventually down the road have all these additional resources online and et cetera. Um, that's what I'm thinking. Thank you. Other thoughts? I have more questions. Let me check the time. So, well, we're, we're getting close, but one I wanted to make sure we did ask um, is that, you know, we've heard a few people share that um, they might use Google to get information. But, you know, we'd love to hear from folks of, you know, how, um, how people get, we've been trying to learn from people how folks are getting information about pregnancy and parenting. And we've known it's been tough. It's hard to find the resources. And now, you know, people might Google um, for things. But where ideally should people start other than their medical offices, right, doctor's offices? and how we can help people distinguish between reliable and unreliable resources. I know I look at something on Google and it's like overwhelming with all the pages of things that can come up and what's actually really reliable, right? And so beyond kind of like resources you might get from your doctor's office, um, how would, you know, where would we want people to start? How can we make sure they get um, how would you want access to information and resources beyond the doctor's office? <laughs> Perfect. Well, I know at least they, just so you know that there there is a lot of um, resources on the Reeve, um, Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation um, on disabilities and, and parenting, knowing your rights as a parent. Um, so... There's also the Nurse Linda and, and so forth. So there is one, you know, location that has some good information than just the, at least a reliable source um, because it is in the disability community. Um, but I don't know of at least that one. But, of course, there's a wish list of, of where places would be. But um, And I think both professionals and organizations like ourselves at, at Spinal Cord or you know, Ability360, having that on our website as well um, would be great. Hey, this is John again. 
Um, I think that it would be good to have one central website that maybe listed, you know, Arizona Spinal Cord Injury Association for the sources they have and any other organizations like Raising Special Kids, um, all on one central website about parenting um, because there's a variety of different types of disabilities and, you know, you you would tackle parenting probably differently for each one. Um, and everybody is unique too, even when it comes to like specific disabilities. Um, I know there's like over 22 different types of muscular dystrophy and they all affect people differently. Um, so having that central source and a variety of information on there and partnering with different organizations like ASTAP, because uh, ASTAP has um, a lot of adaptive equipment that and they come out to you to your home to like let you test out the equipment so all these different resources and information about parenting for a variety of disabilities in that central location could potentially be the main place that you come to when you search online and it could potentially spread way beyond arizona across the u.s where people are searching on those specific keywords and they land on that web page and it could very beneficial for a lot of people having that one source of information. Um, and the information could be vetted then by, I mean, hopefully there's funding for staff to manage all that because I know it's a lot. I've built websites. I know it's a lot to manage. Um, but that I think would be really useful as a starting point for a lot of people. Any other Final thoughts, ideas. I'm also looking, we have a lot of young people in the room and I can tell you, we've tried doing stuff on, like a lot of us organizations have things on Facebook. None of the young people use that anymore. And so, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about this next generation, right? So it's like, what, do y'all have any ideas about where you'd want to get information? Um, I feel like a lot of young people use TikTok um, daily and especially to get information from varying individuals. I certainly have followed some uh, content creators who have disabilities and I've learned a little bit um, about what it's like to live with their specific disability from just them sharing their experience. So I definitely feel like um, uh, a lot of these centers could use that, that platform specifically to share stories um, from parents with disabilities, as that is something that is definitely lacking in the space. I feel like there could be a lot more information shared. Of course, it's difficult to also know who uh, is sharing uh, appropriate information. Um, so that, that is difficult with such a big platform where everybody can just post whatever they want. Uh, but I definitely feel like having uh, actual uh, centers that can share accurate information would be uh, very beneficial to the younger generations. Thank you. Thank you. And I know I said that was the last question. I'll be having one more because we see how many folks are in this room right now, right? Do folks have ideas on how we can really increase participation and dialogue with different communities? I mean, Jenna shared a little bit about reluctance maybe from parents with children about wanting to talk about this, but how can we continue to grow the network of people who's part of this conversation, willing to share the resources and tools that our, our collaborative and others create around this topic? Uh, I mean, you could have those social media pages, which most of them have a, you know, they're free to start. Um, and that could be the central hub where information is released and all the partner organizations then using a media kit could then share that out to the community. Um, Probably that that conference would be a good start to start generating, um, you know, 
potentially get more people interested in the subject, um, potentially doing putting things out through the news to get people like to uh, PR piece about the disparities and issues so that more people are aware of it and then have a call to action to like, oh, by the way, if you want to get more information, here's where you can get it. Um, <clears throat> we're hosting this conference or that might be a good way to do it, to really get it out there to a lot of people. Anna, again, um, one thing I think we know is that with individuals, the idea of being pregnant and parenting is seasonal. So it's not like, you know, so, so it's always going to be a different point in everyone's life. So I don't know that there's always going to be a huge population looking for this type of information all at once. But what we do know is that, and we've heard it over and over again, is this need for clinicians to have better awareness and, um, you know, uh, training and um, sensitivity and also this, this normalization of these conversations. So where I'm going with that is perhaps in order to reach the clinicians, we go through the health plans. So maybe we want to engage some conversations with some of the larger health plans that serve the long-term care communities um, or the DD communities. Um, I don't know. I'm just troubleshooting, uh, but if we're trying to get at clinicians, they get paid by the health plan and money talks. And if they're incentivized to attend a conference or a training, then maybe that might be one way we can help get the word out. Hello, my name is Rosa Watson. Um, I'm a school teacher in Tucson. And I was just thinking, as John was speaking earlier, that Another way to get information out to the community, especially within the public school system, is um, promoting more health and wellness fairs within different communities. Um, I, we, have, we have things that occur throughout the year, but I rarely see things for uh, parents and children with disabilities at the health and wellness fair. So definitely making it more available, the information more available to communities at, in situations like that for public schools, I know would be really helpful. Thank, thank you all so much for sharing. I know we, we've gone a little over the time here, and I want to check if these are okay. No. Um, I'm going to, we're, we're going to wrap up. I know we do have, uh, um, so we just want to invite everyone uh, who's here. If you want to give feedback, we are continuing to uh, move forward with the project. So we are looking to form the support groups, create curriculum, uh, education materials, trainings, um, and also put together information sessions, family events. Um, and we want everyone's feedback uh, we want to make sure that we're consulting people with lived experience like the whole way. So if you would like to provide feedback on any of the future aspects of this project, please reach out to me. My email address is there. We'll make sure that you all get the information and have the opportunity to um, voice uh, whatever it is you think that we need to do.